Hello. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Women and Children First, the virtual space. Uh, my name is Sarah Hallenbeck. I'm the co-owner here of Women and Children First. We are one of the last feminist bookstores left standing in the United States. And we're so honored to have all of you here tonight to celebrate this virtual conversation in celebration of Lily Danzinger's memoir, Negative Space. I'll hold it up for all of you to see this beautiful cover. We are thrilled to have one of my favorite writers and humans here as well, Megan Steelstra, to interview Lily for this conversation that I've been looking forward to for many months. Before we begin our virtual event, we uh, begin our events the same way we begin our events here in the store with a land acknowledgement. So please join me in acknowledging that the land on which this bookstore stands is the unceded territory of the Peoria, Potawatomi, Miami, and Sioux people. There are over 75,000 indigenous people living in Illinois, and we strive to recognize Native literature and honor Native communities. We encourage all of you watching to learn more about land acknowledgments and the rightful owners of the land where you are viewing tonight's event. Um, after nearly a whole year of being closed to the public, Women and Children First here in Chicago is now open. We're open for a limited capacity in-store browsing from noon to six, um, Tuesday through Sunday, we are closed on Monday because we're exhausted. <laughs> so we hope that you'll stop by if you're in Chicago. We also offer curbside pickup and we can ship anywhere in the United States. And for now, all of our events are going to continue right here on Crowdcast um, in this virtual space. A couple of notes if you wanna ask a question tonight, please do so by using the ask a question box um, right at the bottom of the screen. And then Megan will ask Lily all of your wonderful questions. Um, and if you haven't bought Lily's incredible book, you can do so by clicking the buy the book button also at the bottom of your screen. We have a couple of signed book plates left um, that will tuck into each of your books. All right, I think that leads us to the main event. Lily Danziger is a contributing editor at Catapult and assistant editor at Barrel House Books. She's the author of Negative Space, which was selected by Carmen Maria Machado, also an amazing human, as one of the winners of the 2019 Santa Fe Writers Project. She's the editor of Burn It Down, a critically acclaimed anthology of essays on women's anger. Her writing has been published in Longreads, Washington Post, Glamour, Rolling Stone, and many others. And she lives in New York City. Megan Steelstra is the author of three collections, Everyone Remained Calm, Once I Was Cool, and The Wrong Way to Save Your Life, named the 2017 Book of the Year in nonfiction by the Chicago Review of Books. Her work appears in Best American Essays, the New York Times, The Believer, Poets and Writers, Long Roots, Tin House, and on National Public Radio. She teaches creative and nonfiction at Northwestern University. We'll also be hosting some events with Megan later in the summer for the reissue of two of her books. And we're very excited about that. I will put links to pre-order Megan's books in the chat bar during the event. So there is so much I love about negative space, so much to gather from it in regard to the mythologies that we build around artists and that we build around our own families. And in this case, that intersection of those two. One of the things that you talk about, Lily, that was so perfect is just how grief doesn't happen just that one time, but how when you lose someone, that person continues to evolve even after their death, and that we are, we the living are then called to meet and grieve that person over and over again. 
you document that continuous meeting and grieving in a way that I just found so compelling and just kept catching in my throat. This book is just so resonant, so beautifully crafted, and I can't wait to listen to this conversation. So please help me welcome Lily Danziger and Nathan Stilstra. Hi, thank you, Sarah. Um, this is a, is a quick way to, to kick off. I, I wanna acknowledge the history that we're all living in right now. Uh, there's a pandemic, a polarizing political climate, a racial uprising, centuries in the making, and the deeply personal mountains that you are all moving each day. There are teachers in this space. I know, I see you. There are nurses and frontline workers, organizers, activists. There are people trying to make art and trying to make rent or you're caring for people who are sick or for seniors, you're caring for children, you're making impossible choices in impossible conditions. And in the midst of all this work and fear and change, I hope you're caring for yourself a little bit as well. I think we put our own selves second or third or 10th. And if you see yourself in that sentence, I invite you to just take a second and breathe. Um, books for me are, are breathing. Uh, this has been a year defined by grief. And there's this incredible scene in Lily's memoir where she's teaching her two-year-old goddaughter to play in the sprinkle, sprinklers in Thompson Square Park. And at the end of the scene, she writes, I felt the first gentle tugs towards a life that was defined by more than grief. And y'all, I lost it. I <laughs> ugly cried alone with my bourbon and my galley. I, I don't think I fully understood until that moment how heavy this past year lived in my body. And, to be able to imagine that there would come a time for a life defined by more uh, was a gift that I'm still trying to understand, let alone articulate it. So I'm so thrilled to be here to talk with Lily and all of you tonight. Thank you to Sarah and the team at Women and Children First for making this weird, wonderful online space for us. When you are at the bookstore, buy negative space and burn it down. Get yourself another book or two or five because bookstores need us and we need them. And this is how we will rebuild this beautiful mess of a world. Lily, hi, I love you. Um, will you read hi, for us? Hi, yes. Hi, I love you. Thank you so much Good. for being here. I'm and so excited to be here. Me too. Thank you for that introduction. And thank sure. you, Sarah. Um, I'm going to read a section. I, you know, I've, this is, I've been doing a bunch of virtual events in the last month or so. So I decided to read a section that I haven't read except for the audiobook. Um, and it's also a section that kind of connects to burn it down a little bit since you know if you haven't read it megan has a really really great piece in the collection so felt appropriate <clears throat> the first time i talked to my father about heroin i was eight when i stayed with him on weekends after my parents split up he slept on the carpeted floor of the room he was renting and i slept on the bed he would watch with pursed lips while I carefully brushed the plaster and sawdust, metal and pencil shavings from the dingy sheet before lying down, occasionally commenting that I had inherited a fear of dirt from my mother as if it was a weakness of character from which he was lucky not to suffer. Across from the bed, under the room's one window, was my purple desk that we had found on the street. There were small chips in the paint, so we went to the drugstore and found a nail polish just the right color to patch it up. I would sit at this desk and work diligently while we played a game he invented called Studio, where we both pretended to be artists sharing a studio space, each working on our own projects. While we worked, we would listen to either Bach or Miles Davis, or on the few occasions that I wore him down, no doubt. Studio was a way to keep me occupied so he could work, but it also created some of my best memories of him an approximation of what it might have been like to spend time with him as an adult, in comfortable silence, both of us working. He worked on his sculptures and I attempted to make myself a pet robotic dog with a wire skeleton and a paper towel roll digestive tract, the kid version of his dog carcass sculpture, though I had never seen it. I also made my first ever carving a princess out of a bar of soap, which my father suggested as good practice material. He showed me how to use a chisel like this, he said, miming a smooth downward gesture away from my body, an angle that would make it nearly impossible for me to stab myself if I replicated it properly. He trusted me to be careful with potentially dangerous tools, though when he taught me how to use a table saw, he joked that maybe we both needed adult supervision. 
On the third wall, next to the door, was a stack of milk crates he used as a bookshelf. One day, I pulled out one of the big hardcover art books that I love to pour over, looking for paintings of beautiful women to inspire my princess drawings. Probably Rembrandt, Renoir, or Sargent. As I flipped through the book, I found a piece of tin foil tucked between the pages. It was folded into a square with several small circles burned into it. I often pretended to know less than I really did about grown-up things going on around me, partly so that adults would continue to be candid and I could learn more, and partly to avoid the awkwardness of them crouching down to have serious conversations with me. But I had a vague understanding that my parents were addicts. I idolized super smart girls in books like Matilda and Harriet the Spy. I was the kind of eight-year-old who could figure out what a methadone clinic was for. I knew that addiction was a problem my parents were dealing with, but I didn't differentiate it from the other grown-up problems they worried about, like paying rent or keeping the house clean. I knew enough to understand that drugs were bad for you, but in the same abstract way I knew that broccoli was good for you. Playing innocent, I held up the piece of tinfoil and asked in my sweetest voice, Papa, what's this? He didn't answer right away. He looked hurt, like when I told him I didn't want to try out a new drawing technique. It was a look I worked hard to avoid, and one that could get me to change my mind in an instant, to draw or paint or read whatever he wanted me to. The look I later imagined might have been the only thing that could have convinced me not to drop out of high school. After some deliberation, he answered honestly, that's from doing drugs, and then dishonestly, but it's from a long time ago. It must have gotten lost in that book. He wanted to tell me the truth, but also didn't know how to admit his weakest, lowest parts to the little curly-headed girl who stared up at him like he glowed. Then I guess the guilt got to him, and after another long pause, he told me that actually it was recent, that he had stopped again and was doing better. I believed him and appreciated him not talking to me like I was a kid. He came over and kissed the top of my head, surrounding me in the smell of tobacco and plaster, and then we went back to playing studio. After that, there was a shift. Now he understood that I was watching, that I knew what was going on. Over the next couple of years, I would ask him about it even when there was no tinfoil to arouse my suspicion. He started telling me honestly how his efforts to get clean were going. He didn't use the word heroin or even the words drugs or addiction, but I would ask how he was doing and he would know what I meant. Really well, he would say, I'm healthy. Or sometimes he would say he was dealing with some stuff or that he was not doing so great, gonna get better again soon. When he eventually went to inpatient rehab, he apologized to me over the phone and said the doctors were helping him there, making it, making it so he could stay healthy when he, when he left. And then there were those last phone calls where he assured me he was healthy and we made plans to camp under the redwoods. We had our code and it worked. And I'd never doubted, even when the adults did, that he'd been healthy when he died. As a teenager, I was angry at everything but him. My father was the beloved lost, blameless as a saint, while I blasted my anger like buckshot at my mother, at teachers, at truant officers and cops and store owners. Even when my teenage rage slowed to a simmer in early adulthood, I thought of my father's death as something that had happened to him, cruel and random. But then I learned about Kathy and started to doubt the murky, once comforting half-truth about his death that I'd clung to for so long. Slowly, over time, creeping up on me, sneaking in through trap doors, a realization started to form. As I walked to the store, I started to question what I knew for sure about my father's death. In yoga class, I thought about how vindicated I'd been by the autopsy report, uh, which said undetermined causes. How angry at Audrey and everyone who'd assumed it was an overdose. Sitting on my couch drinking coffee, I thought about the last 10 years of my life when I somehow believed that my father's mysterious death had nothing to do with his drug use, and how I now knew that he'd started using by the mid 80s at the latest, likely the late 70s, off and on until just a few months before he died in 2000. And I felt like a fucking idiot. A 43 year old man's organs don't just shut down for no reason. And the damage done by poisoning yourself for two decades isn't instantly reversed the moment you stop. Then, like an electric shock, I wondered if it was even really true that he was clean when he died. I'd held that wind so tightly for so long, it had turned into a hard, resentful little stone in the core of me. Was it even real? My mother could have lied to me about the report. I'd never read it myself. I'm going to stop there. 
<laughs> this is where all of the applause is happening. Okay, <laughs> there is so much that I want to talk to you about, but I, I actually, I can, can I want to start with with this scene, I, and and some of the choices behind it because the, the, so much of the of the story is like moving chronologically as you're growing up, but you made a pretty like a, a choice that you that you tell us right at the beginning of the book. Hey, I'm I, I'm I'm not going to get into the drug use until later. Yeah. And 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 so the, the scene that you just read happens later in the book, even though chronologically it would have happened a lot earlier. And I'm wondering if you can talk about that choice a little bit. Like I'm thinking about um, was that there to did you make that choice to care for yourself in the own process or thinking about how the reader would react to your dad? Um, uh, both. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't I didn't dive into the addiction part of the story first for myself, but then I also, I kept it later mm -hmm. for, you know, to let the reader know this is not going to be a salacious, my dad was a junkie story. Mm -hmm. And if that's what you're looking for, go somewhere else, mm -hmm. <laughs> basically. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, yeah, that's part of it. And, and that is a piece of the story that I couldn't deny or evade or sweep under the rug, but it also was not, it was never the most interesting part of the story to me. You know, it was never the most essential thing about who my father was or who even my parents were or about my childhood or about the story I was here to tell, you know? Mm -hmm. And so when I eventually get to that, it's, it's after you've already gotten to know my father as mm -hmm. an artist, as a funny, goofy, smart, brilliant, prolific artist and father and after you've already gotten to know me and you've seen that anger that I reference, you know, and this mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. kind of contextualizing it and making sense of it later. Cause that's also how it happened in, in life. You know, I didn't mm -hmm. really make the connection between the angry teenager that I was and the fact that my father had died two years before all that started, mm -hmm. you know, it seems obvious when you look back at it, but I, I didn't really understand that at the time. Yeah. It, it, I, I really deeply appreciated it, like in and even like in that or just where you chose to put it in the book, because I uh, like you said, I mean, I just coming at it from someone who obviously who didn't know him, but I I loved him by the time we got to that. And I think so often, you know, this comes back to the Adichie danger of a single story thing, like like so often when we hear stories about addiction, we're just seeing the addiction and not the the human being who's wrestling within it. Um, uh, I'm wondering about. Um, about how all of that fit into how you thought about memory, right? Mm -hmm. Because the, the two things that are happening at the same time in the book are the the story of what you remembered and then you reading all of your father's papers, starting to talk to all of his friends. You know, I'm I'm giving this heads up here to the to the folks who haven't been lucky enough to read the book yet, but oh my God, what a ride. Uh, <laughs> but um right and so so and just even you sitting and digging into his digging into his papers, it starts to kick back all these memories that you didn't even know you had. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk about like what, just the things that surprised you going through this process, because it was a long process too in writing it. Yeah, it's weird, you know, when I started writing, I felt like I didn't remember a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I remember, I remember flashes, you know, I remember moments, I remember you know, I remember that one conversation. Um, and that was actually, I had to, I revised that scene over and over again because I, I had written it and saying, you know, I saw the piece of tinfoil and I, and I knew it was connected to drugs. And everybody who read that scene was like, how did you know? Why did you, you were eight. How did you know that? What did you, I, was like, I don't know, I just did. You know, I knew. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, and that wasn't just my memory of it, you know, and so even things like that, like you start to question your memory when you put it down and then people push against mm -hmm. it and ask you questions. But it was kind of, it was like pulling a thread, you know, and once you start writing the memories, more things fill in, you know, and I, I started trying to describe that room and I realized that like, yeah, okay, I actually remember exactly where all the furniture was in that room. And I remember the carpet with like all the stains on it because he just used a carpeted room as an art studio which you know <laughs> like completely destroyed that carpet in this room he was subletting um and i remember the gate on the front door that he had to jump over once when he locked himself out and i remember the 
when there was a tree planted on that block and I was so excited and I thought they had put it there for us. And I remember the story, you know, it's just one thing after another starts to come to you. Yep. Um, so I was recording, you know, I was recording what I was learning from interviews and I was also just recording separately everything that was coming up for me. Each time I talked to somebody new, each time I wrote a new scene, each time I read a letter, it brought back like 10 new things. Yeah, yeah, like right at the beginning, you when you talk about reading the, the letter, the, the last one that that he wrote you and uh, and how all of a sudden you started remembering everything about your you and your mom had moved to live in is it is it is it Carmel right mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you started remembering all of these things about Carmel and how you were trying really hard to be difficult to your mom and Tom because of just like <laughs> all of these things that you were carrying but just all these things that you remembered about the place just in reading his letter talking about it yeah um, yeah yep and then it comes up again later when you're interviewing your mother and she says I don't I don't have a good memory. Mm -hmm. And then, and that made me start thinking a little bit with her about how trauma defines and changes memory. And I, I know you're also in wrestling with grief, you're wrestling with a lot of trauma here. And I'm wondering how that was affecting your memory of some of these events. Yeah, I and mean, I'm sure, I'm sure that it was, you know, I mean, I, it makes gaps, you know, but it also makes some things stand out in really sharp relief, you know? Um, yeah. And, and both of those existing at the same time. But I, I think it's, I think we tend to doubt ourselves, you know? I mean, when I noted that my mom always oh, says she doesn't have a good memory, but she does though, you know, she doesn't remember yeah. like dates or, you know, she doesn't necessarily remember like what order things happened in or, or whatever, but she remembers a lot of texture and detail and a lot of emotion, you know, and she was able to give me really evocative, detailed accounts, you know, and really, it should really paint a picture of a lot of mm -hmm. those times before I was born or when I was really little, you know, and she would tell me this whole story and tell me what she was wearing and everything she thought and felt and this, like these specific conversations and like this kind of flower that he brought to her. And then, you know, and say, oh, but you know, I don't have a good memory. Yeah. And so that started to make me think, you know, maybe that's maybe i'm kind of doing that too and i feel like i don't remember it i don't remember much but then here i am pouring out memory after memory <laughs> yeah 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 and you're going back and forth between memory and then all of the source material that you had of that which was a lifetime of your father's papers that you carted from apartment to apartment where uh, do you still read those do you still look at them or are they did did this excavation close something for you with that i still do you know i mean i the papers and letters and stuff were like you know one of the first layers of the research part of the process you mm -hmm. know so that was more than a decade ago now that i've you know that i did that first deep dive into all of them and then when i was doing the last revision and i was starting to have that panic about like oh my god i'm about to not be able to change anything or add anything else and like you know <laughs> yeah yeah feeling um i went back and looked through all of them again um and actually found a bunch more stuff that i did you add in. you did yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um and there you know there were also i found some things that i was like oh i should have added that but it's too late now because it would have to be a whole thing you know yeah, like there was, yeah. there was a letter that he wrote me um, right before he died, where he told me this whole story, he was like, he was living on this property in California doing construction, and he wrote me this whole letter about he was digging a, a ditch and accidentally like unearthed a mouse nest and like accidentally destroyed the nest, and how he felt so bad, and there were all these baby mice, and so he, he like put the nest back together and moved it to under this bush that was there and then sat there for hours and waited to make sure that the mama mouse found the babies. You know, and it was like this whole like drama, like, you know, the fairy tales and, and fables and stuff that he would read to me um, because he knew that I would have been deeply concerned about what was gonna happen to the baby mice. You know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and yeah, and so, you know, I read that and I, of course it was like laughing and crying reading it and like, you know, that it's just such a tender and sweet thing. Like they're doing construction, but like, I'm going to take the rest of the day off and make sure this mouse finds her babies. <laughs> that, okay. Okay. No, but what was that a, was that a rarity in his papers? Because so much of, so much of the book was 
like you finally digging into these journals as as an adult and wanting to get to to know him better and realizing that his journals were more him talking about his art process. So you had to find him through yeah. his art. Yeah, that was not in one of the journals. That was a okay. letter that he specifically wrote to me. So there was much more of that you know, personal stuff in, in the letters. Yeah, too. yeah. Well, um, like the, the sense of audience of him talking to a little girl versus exactly, him, talking yeah. to him talking to yourself. <laughs> Cybar, is that his art behind you? Yes. Will you yeah. will you show us? Yeah, this is um a really delicate paper it's one of nice. rabbit. Yeah, and this is the ears are just like one thin layer of plastic or sorry, of paper. So they're they're like very, very delicate. Um Y'all, there are there are photographs throughout the book of all of the artwork, but it's it's an entirely different experience than seeing it 3D like that. Yeah, I just you know I figured I would. What you see that? Like, yeah. Um, and this, this one also comes with its own. It has a little cigar box case that he made for it with like tin foil to hold it in place because it's so fragile. <laughs> In the in the journals, when he's talking about I the, and this I, I loved this, but like in his journals, he's talking about how at, at times like really frustrated he is with the art making process, and it it made me because I I've read the Lit Hub essay that you wrote about writing this book and coming back on like pulling back on the contract and like talking with different editors, and I'm I'm just wondering about the like just even digging a little bit into the frustration of the art making process mm -hmm. and how you see yourself in him with that too. Yeah, that was, that was funny to see, you know, and I, yeah, I felt, I felt like there's a lot of humor in those lines, like referring to a wire he was trying to use that was too thin, so like working with a pubic hair. You know, it's just like, um, it's, it's funny and like, yeah, but you can also feel the frustration of like trying to get these materials to work. And, uh -huh. and yeah, I felt that a lot. You know, I felt doing the structure of this book, I, I described it like a game of Jenga. You know, I kept just, it's like everything kept needing to be moved up, but the whole thing was getting more and more of a mess as I was moving each individual piece up. And I started mm -hmm. to feel like, you know, I was losing touch with reality a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, my husband was making jokes about The Shining, but it was not that far off from reality. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the the book starts with the last time that the, the two of you were together before his death. Did you always know it was going to start there? No, no. Okay. It started pretty much every chapter in the book was the first chapter at one point. Okay. I never, that finding where to start was one of the hardest parts. Um, there actually, it wasn't, there was an editor who suggested that part I just read as the opening because that's, you know, the drama but I was very particular about not starting there for the reasons we talked about. Yep. Yeah. Beginning. Um, I was like, yeah, I see what you're see what you're going for. That would make a great beginning for a very different book than the one I'm trying to write. Right. Right. Um, how did so? Obviously, you are an editor as well, too. So, how does your editor brain? I I, I listened to a, a talk with the editor. Sarah, Sarah Botton the other night and, and she was talking about how the that her that her editor brain has to power down before she can in, like power up her <laughs> her writer brain so I'm wondering is that a similar process for you just, just because what what you just said was very smart and very slick and very together just you even being like well that is a that is a difference with another book where whereas I would just be like my writer brain is like oh my god what if I don't know maybe I should try it for the next six months and then figure it out um yeah I uh, I mean the two the two exist together I mean you know I'm, I'm a Gemini right so I think I can I can be the writer brain and the editor brain at the same time and they mm -hmm. can most of the time cooperate with each other sometimes mm -hmm. fight with each other but most of the time you know take turns um I do have to kind of trick myself into writing just like the messy stuff, you know, the messy first drafts. I don't call yeah. drafts, I call notes, you know? So I write, I make a lot of notes and I, I collect notes that are not writing, they're just, you know, ideas. And I'll email them to myself on my phone at night, you know, and I'm like, just like, this is an idea of a scene. This is not the scene, this is just the idea of the yeah. scene. 
But and then if I actually write the scene, I will describe, you know, the chill and the yeah. air and the this and the that. You know? yeah. Do you ever wake up in the morning and are like, what the hell did I? See, yes. Yeah. Okay. But usually I can figure it out okay. after a minute. But yeah, sometimes I'm like, what? You know, especially with like, if I, especially if it's on my phone and it's like in the dark and I'm half asleep and there's a lot of like autocorrect. Mm -hmm. A canoe, fairy, what? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I want to talk. I want to talk about imagination, right? So you've got you've got all the source material, it, source materials in his letters, in his journals, in his art. Um, you've got your own memory. There are the extensive interviews that you did with everyone, um, but there were a lot of scenes that you had to imagine. And I kept. I eventually I started trying to clock the just the verbs. I wonder. Mm -hmm. I imagine. I picture. Because when the I. I this is just masterfully done, Lily. I don't, I don't mean to like blow smoke up your ass, but it was just so cool. Like you'll be, you'll be talking to one of his friends, and they'll tell you something, and then it'll pause, and you'll say, "I, I shut my eyes for a while and time, tried to time travel," and then you'll go off into in like extensive scene building about what you thought happened, and I'm just wondering, like how how often those changed, or like how deep you wanted to get into that scene construction. Those all came later. Um, you know, I mean, okay, so you ask about like writer brain and, and editor brain and, and yeah. those get along together. But what I had to fight with a lot with this project is journalist brain, which is, you know, is where my uh -huh. training is and where I, you know, I started this project very much thinking of myself as a journalist. And by the end, you know, now I don't, I haven't done reporting in a while. That's not really my it's like not where I work anymore, but I was transitioning mm -hmm. out of that over the course of writing this book and kind of had to get out of that mindset in order to write the book. Because at mm -hmm. first I was very limiting, very limited to, you know, what I could verify, what I had first person accounts of, or, you know, documentation of, or I didn't want to make any guesses. I didn't want to get anything wrong. You know, I didn't, I didn't want to be subjective about telling somebody else's life story. You know, and I just didn't want to make things up. Um, mm -hmm. It was only after several years of being really immersed in the research and filling in as much as I could um, that I had I kind of had to like kick myself over that ledge because there was still a gap between you know everything that I could verify and an immersive, tangible story. You know, I still mm -hmm. felt this distance and like I wasn't making his story real and vivid and tangible enough on the page yet. And I had to, I had to do something to address that. And the only thing I think of was to imagine those scenes and, and to let myself go there. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So one, you know, so they didn't change that much because they were added, you know, pretty late in the process. Okay. It's just like, these are the gaps, you know, that I, that I have to fill and, yeah. and I just let myself take that leap. Yeah. Is that a thing that you, new or is that a thing that you came at with feedback or I, I I know that you work with a writer's group and I'm I'm just thinking of all the writers who are sitting here on this call with us who are like holy like really how did you do it? How do I make my how do how do I do this? Right. So it wasn't nobody told me particularly that I had to imagine scenes, but people told me that my storyline felt more immediate and engaging. You know, and that they were not connecting as much with my father's story. And I knew it was because so much of it was secondhand. You know, you're getting these stories through interviews and, you know, right. I'm piecing it together, but you never can quite see into it. You never dropped into the scene like you were in my storyline because I was telling that from memory so I could create all these scenes. Um, right. And so when I was looking at them, trying to figure out, you know, why is this one more engaging than this one that was the obvious difference is that there were way more scenes in my right. so it's like okay well i have right. to write some scenes i gotta right. just do it <laughs> and so then it, it gets into kind of like this inception sort of a thing because you're like you the journalist are in the scene with your dad's friends you're you're sitting with him in the bar you're walking around with him at the at the gallery opening so we're in those scenes but then we need to go into the scenes of their dialogue and what you imagined exactly yeah, because those scenes, those scenes of the interview, you know, that was a, that was my my first kind of solution to that problem, right? It's like I'm going to make mm -hmm. this storyline more scene rich by making it 
the you know the detective novel stories, what I've been yeah. calling it, you know. Yeah. Um, but then that's still that's still me at the end of the day, right? That's still mm -hmm. my story, even though it's me looking at his story. But then you need to see what I'm looking at. Yeah, yeah. I I think for anybody trying to tell somebody else's story, like that's always the question of like why why does this matter to me, and therefore why should it matter? Mm -hmm. To a, a bigger audience, y'all. There's a ask a question box down here, and I'm already seeing some start to show up. So I'm just gonna we're just gonna start pulling some of these things. Um, Lily, can you talk about how you decided when to refer to your parents as Heidi or Joe versus mother, father, papa, etc.? Yeah. Hi, um, hi Jessica. <laughs> yeah. So I call them my mother and my father when I'm speaking about them in their relationship to me. Mm -hmm you know, in the scenes that I remember, um, in my reflection about them and our relationship, but they're Joe and Heidi when they are living their own story separate from me, mm -hmm. you know, when they're, when they're living the story that I was reporting on. Um, so before I was born, before they were anybody's mother and father, they were Joe and Heidi. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, and that was also a way of making them more, of making that story more tangible and immersive and vivid is to, you know, let them be human beings, which was a big part of what the project was anyway, right? Is it was like learning to see them as people separate from me. Um, and so making that distinction of using their names for those parts mm -hmm. of the story was, mm -hmm. was one way to mm -hmm. keep that separate. Yeah. Is is that a thing that that this book gave you was being able to see your parents as human beings? Yeah. Um it was something that the book required of me, I think. You know? yeah. um, gave me, but also, you know, that I had to, I had to do that in order to tell the story in a way that was multidimensional and real and complicated, you know, to let them be human beings and not just my parents. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I, I was thinking about that all through the, the book and like how because it, it was a it was 10 years you took because or in in the book you'll say I, I sat down to do this thinking it was going to take a year yeah and how how long did it it take since you made the decision that you were making a book until i you know i kept saying 11 years and then i think it was like 11 total of writing it and so now you know now that it's actually out it was 12 years ago that i started it okay Okay. Yeah. And did that, and did that start? And then, and that's, that's what started with the decision to sit down and read all of his stuff. Yeah. And yeah. And wanting and starting to like put the art into context and, and yeah, just realizing that I wanted to investigate and learn more. Yeah. It, it feels wild for, for me to be asking you a question about, time like that like how long because I'm not sure if time exists anymore <laughs> and I and there, there was a, like one of the parts that, there were so many parts in this where like I had to put down the book because it felt like you were writing about our lives right now like like there was a, a line um two years is nothing a flash in the scope of a life um uh you, you know and, and you're talking about trying to to deal with with sh shattering grief right but like when you're in it it feels like it's lasting forever but then when you're out of it it's it's just like that and and i've been i've been thinking about that line every every single day i know that there's not a question in what i just said just basically i'm back to to blowing smoke at you okay <laughs> um all right i'd love to hear how lily decided not to number or name the chapters uh yeah um they had names once upon a time, um, but I didn't want to, it felt like too much like giving you the answers. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't want to signal so much what each chapter was about because each mm -hmm. chapter was really about a lot of things. And so I wanted the reader to decide what they were about. Mm -hmm. And then, and they didn't have numbers because after the amount of time that I, the amount of times that I rearranged them, Mm -hmm. numbers felt way too definitive of like this is the order when you know by the time I was deciding on the order I had I had kind of accepted that like 
they could kind of go in any order. It, you know, at one point I was like, I'm just going to make it a choose your own adventure. We're going to put all the chapters together and you can read them in whatever order you want. Because I couldn't figure out the structure. And so saying, you know, this is one, two, three, that it felt like a, like a pretend amount of confidence in the order of the story. And, and I wanted them to just kind of, they just flow together and this is the order they happen to fall in. And here you go. How okay, but on this line, like how uh, like how chapters are organized, we have to talk about how the visual art fits into the book. Yes. And yeah. so, when did that come into play? Because the the it for those who haven't read the book yet, like the visual art situates at the end of chapters after Lily digs into those particular periods, right? In in your dad's artistic work. Yeah, um, mostly at the end, and sometimes with a couple in between, also. Um, yeah, the art I kind of thought of as like one of the narrative strands, you know, so there's mm -hmm. like there's three written narrative strands and one visual narrative strand. And I, in order to not like, totally lose my mind and complete orientation in time and reality, I had to think of them as like, there was kind of like a hierarchy or a pecking order of the strands where they follow each other in you know i was thinking of like reading about like you know um primate society hierarchies what i was thinking about narrative structure um where like the visual art is this is the boss of the structure this is <laughs> um, the greatest moment of my life okay <laughs> <laughs> so the yeah the visual art is is the is like the central thread that everything else follows and falls in around and this kind of second in command or you know the, the mate of that narrative thread is my father's life story because those two naturally go together because his you know the, the art fits into the phases of his life um so those are that those are like the power couple boss king and queen baboon of the narrative structure <laughs> this is, sounds absurd but it, oh my god i love it i love it and then and then my, and then the research story of me, you know, the detective novel story mm -hmm. wrap, kind of wraps around that pair, making sense of it and leading the narrate, leading the reader through it. And then my actual story of like my life after my father's death is like the lowest, is the pawn, the lowest in the pecking order of like slots in where it fits around those existing three braided strands. Um Am I allowed to give you assignments? Is that weird? Like, can you sure. can you make that into an essay? You can just like you can just play back this because this is a, like this is I, I see the little live audio. You can just play it back and transcribe just what you said verbatim. <laughs> like, I'm thinking of like the 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 writers who are on this thread, and so many of us like have this like how how do I structure this stuff? How do I find it? Um, and so this we all need this. Okay, <laughs> we all need this, please. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, all right. Um, okay, here we are in here. Um, in addition to Lily's incredible memoir, what other writing related to family members with addiction would you all recommend? Hmm. Um, I mean, Long Live the Tribe of Fatherless Girls by T. Kira Madden mm -hmm. is really, really great. Um, and I think was an example that I looked to, you know, to, to, affirm for myself that it was possible to tell a story like this in a way that was honest and ugly and messy, but also not salacious or exploitative at all. Mm -hmm. And and also put, you know, the love within the family at the forefront and didn't let it be overshadowed by the addiction that was being talked about. Mm -hmm. um, also Mother Winter by so uh, Sophia Shalmanov. These are two that I've been recommending constantly because they were both really um, important touchstones for me um, in writing. Mm -hmm. She writes about her mother's alcoholism. And I think it's a great example of, um, she makes really great use of the kind of fragmentation and disorientation and absences and holes and things that are, that are impossible for her to know and just like leans in and builds the story around that instead of, being limited by it, um, which is really mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. um, I come, I come back a lot to um, 
Last Exit to Brooklyn by mm -hmm. Hubert Selby, which is less about a specific family and more about a like a specific community and um, neighborhood. I'm also thinking of like, there are some incredible sections in Lydia Yaknovich's Chronology of Water that where like she, she she'll she talks about alcoholism uh, in one chapter and she, and it's very like, it's, it's very, um, I'm going to use the word dry, like that particular chapter. She's like, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. And then at the end of the chapter, she says, wait, I can do better. Let me tell this again. And then you flip the page and you go to the next chapter and she tells every single thing that she just told you like this, but she tells it like the voice is the voice is drunk. It's mm. it's like there there's no punctuation. It's completely chaotic. You're never exactly sure what's happening, and you wouldn't have been able to understand what was happening in that section had you not just read the the section before that. So just on a craft level, that that jumps to mind so right now. Hi, Laura. Things, amazingly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, another thing that I want to talk about, insofar as things that happened amazingly. It is the progression throughout the book, and I don't know how, throughout your book now, how this, because we're back to talking, we're going to come back to talking about your book now, Lily. Like, and and I, I don't know how this fits into your primate baboon structure that I'm still really excited about. But just as you went through the detective novel, the, the detective story, right? Like as you're going through the research and the interviews and you're trying to understand this man and as, essentially trying to, you're trying to finish his work or maybe not finish, but continue. Yeah. Respond to respond. Yeah. 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 But just all the different realizations, I, I started trying to chart all the different realizations you came to of what art means and what art can do. Mm -hmm. Right. Like there, there's a conversation you were having with a woman named Tink, who's his ex-girlfriend. And you talked about um, making art as a way to try to be loved. Um, and then later on, you were talking about art as a spell to try to raise the dead. And then later on, you were talking about it as a dialogue with the dead, right? And and I'm like, I'm just again wondering over these ten years that you were writing this, like, were, were all those realizations happening in real time? Did you write them in real time when you actually had them, or what, like? How um, some yes and some no. The the book definitely has a much more coherent you know, progression than the yeah. process of writing it did. Um, so, you know, a lot of those were things that I was thinking about at various points in time. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, fit them in where they made sense in the story, not necessarily in that mm -hmm. order. But yeah, as I was, you know, you know, like I said, the whole story is circling around the art, right? It's, it's leading the story. So I mm -hmm. kept coming back to it. And wanting for it to be the key, you know, and wanting and like wanting to talk to it, wanting to read it, wanting to decode it, wanting to, you know, read between the lines of it, wanting to, mm -hmm. you know, peel back the layers of it, wanting to read the story it was telling, you know, some guy was talking about it as cave paintings or as a letter or as, you know, and yeah, it was all of those things in my various attempts to make sense of the story. Mm -hmm. yep. um, Let's talk about how the ending fits into to that here. Cause I've, I've got a question here at one point, at what point in the process did you know what you wanted the end to be? Mm -hmm. And did you know almost as you were living that moment that it was a possible ending for the book? Yeah, I did. Um, it's like, as yeah, as that the, I don't want to. I don't want to tell you what the end is for anybody who hasn't read it. But mm -hmm. yeah, in that the moment that ended up being the end of the book, it's like right after that happened. I was like, mm -hmm. I think that's the end of the book because I had been, I got most of the way through the story and then realized that I had kind of dug myself into a hole because it's like, how do you end a story about grief? Because grief doesn't end. You know, there's not, I was never going to reach a point where I was like, and now I am healed. And I, you know, it's like, right. um, real, and, you know, realizing years into the process that I was writing a story that didn't have an end. And so I, you know, I kind of had that on my mind and then had that moment in Amsterdam that felt like such a 
just a culmination and it felt like a moment of release, you know, which is not, not the same as closure, but it's more true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's a a question here about uh, the Kickstarter campaign. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that specifically, but also that just, I mean, for the, again, the, the writers on the call here and how do we, live while we make this stuff and and what is how does how does all this come into play yeah so the very first draft of the book was my undergraduate thesis so i started it with you know that institutional support and structure and Mm -hmm. you know an, an advisor and deadlines and all of that and then um, I put it aside for a little while and I went to grad school and then I realized that was a mistake and I <laughs> came back to the project and was like, well, I should have just been doing this. Um, and, you know, came back to it. It's like, all right, I want to really turn this into a book. And that was when I thought I needed about a year to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like, you know, I just need to polish it up a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. You know, having no idea that it was actually going to be nine more years after that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was, you know, fresh out of grad school with a hundred grand in debt, back to my bartending job, Mm -hmm. freelance. It's like, I don't know how I'm supposed to have time to write a book. Um, So I decided to do a Kickstarter um, to fund, I can't remember, I think it was originally, I was, you know, I wanted to fund like three or four months of like focused writing time. Mm -hmm. And I was able to successfully do that through a lot of, you know, my, a lot of my dad's friends were, you know, invested in seeing this happen. And also my friends and people I worked at the bar with who had been hearing mm-hmm. me talk about yeah, this project. your community. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it was during that, I actually, I did get a lot of work done in that period of time, you know, mm-hmm. and I was able to really, I think that's when it went from, you know, an undergraduate thesis to a book draft and like mm-hmm. that, actually a first real draft of something that like would be a book eventually. Mm-hmm. Um, I did a lot more. That was when I did like some travel for more interviews that I hadn't been able to do mm-hmm. and really started like piecing the whole thing together and, you know, covering my wall in a timeline and <laughs> all of that. Uh-huh. Um, and then, you know, yeah, at the end of that year, I was the first time that I thought it was done and I queried a bunch of agents and got a bunch of rejections and then mm-hmm. realized that I had more work to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, in the, the last sentence that you just said, right, querying a bunch of agents, realized I had a lot of work to do. Um, <laughs> I I really appreciate how transparent you have been about that whole process. Like you've written about it in a lot of essays. It's in the book. I think it's <laughs> even like like in the acknowledgements. First of all, in the acknowledgements of the book, you you thank the whole Kickstarter campaign. Yeah. Um but also you you thank all of the editors and agents who rejected the book multiple times. And I just, I love the line and it said, you are all right. It wasn't ready. Yeah. Um, and again, I know there are a bunch of writers on the call, so a lot of whom I work with. Hi y'all. <laughs> and, um, and, and who are like, who, and we're asking ourselves this question right now, like, is it, is it ready? And I'm wondering if you can talk about that knowing like is it a is that a body thing is that a gut thing like how what what made you know you know it's hard to answer because i i thought it was done so many times and it was only it's only in retrospect that i can see the difference between it being done and me wanting it to be done (laughs) and like me wanting to be done with it yeah, um, and those are two very different things. Y'all, that's the, that's the money shot right there. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Keep going. Okay. Um, you know, so each time it was very much it was this feeling of, of like, okay, is that enough yet? Like, okay, how about now? You know, like, can I be done yet? Will you take it yet? You know, and it was only, yeah. and it was always with this like kind of hat in hand, like, please take take this for me and give me a book deal. I want to be done. And it was only the last time that I realized that I felt very differently. I I finally felt like it was a book and it was 
done and it was good and I would feel good about people reading it and I had done everything that I wanted to do and there was no more like well if I had more time I would I mean you know of course there still are like little things but there's no more like I want it to be a totally different thing than it is but I don't know how to get it there which yeah. I felt before you know I felt like mm -hmm. if I was a better writer it would be xyz but this is this is all I can do so is that enough yeah and and, no. and was it then was it that draft that you sent to the contest that Carmen and yeah okay okay yeah I I think that, th that that's a that's an important thing to acknowledge in these conversations of how um of how we lift one another up right like I've, I've heard you talking about what Carmen's acknowledgement did for your own heart yeah um, yeah because you know after that many it's I mean you know I as much of a self-assured person as I generally consider myself to be it's hard not to doubt yourself after mm -hmm. 50 plus rejections mm -hmm. of yeah. this thing that you've like bled into for a decade. Mm -hmm. you know, it's yeah. hard not to start to wonder, like, maybe this was a bad idea. Maybe I'm not up to it. Maybe I should just give up, blah, 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 blah. All yeah. those doubt voices. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, having, you know, not just an acceptance, which obviously is great, yeah. but also, like recognition and validation and praise from somebody who mm -hmm. I admire so much. You know, I had just finished reading Carmen's memoir mm -hmm. and I got the letter and she actually like mailed me, you know, the little note about it, which I saved, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think it, it's, it's important to like, to, to, to also say that like all while you were going through that process with your memoir, you, have been lit like can you see my I'm pointing at you now like like you've been lifting up other writers for decades right like I am one of them just like like the the work you did on my margins and burn it down all the women's voices that you lifted up in that particular project everybody that you lift up at catapult and at narratively and at barrel house all the time like this is work that you've constantly been doing um and I think about like years ago I I Cheryl Strayed lifted up a, a piece of mine and I got to meet her and I was trying to thank her and like how do you had like I don't know if you've been able to meet Carmen in person since this happened right but how like how do you thank somebody for that yeah and Cheryl was just like okay listen here's what I need from you uh doors are going to start to open and you're going to walk through them and what I need is for you to turn around and say okay let's go and I, I need you to I need you to 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 bring everybody with you like um, that's yeah and so I, I thought of that when you wrote about about Carmen and I thought about that with how you've lifted up my work and just um I think about that with all the writers who are listening to this conversation right now like as we're trying to put our own work in the world how are we how are we lifting up so thank you for that work that you've been doing all while you were making this story about your own grief to do that for us as well thank you that's, I mean, that's such an important part of it, you know, I mean, at each step of the process, I was getting help, you know, and I was, and that's why I, I you know, wrote that essay about canceling the book deal and all that stuff and being transparent about it is because, you know, I remember trying being at the bottom of that mountain and being like, how the fuck do you publish a book? Right? Yeah. <laughs> and trying to figure it out and asking for help and trial and error and making mistakes and querying too soon. And thinking I was done when I wasn't done and, and all of that, you know? So you're like, mm -hmm. yeah, of course, if I can compress some of that, that's why I teach a, a, a structure workshop is because I had such a hard time with structure. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I spent 10 years trying to figure this out. Let me tell you what I learned so that you don't have to spend 10 years. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right, right. And so this comes back to how we help each other. Yes. Lily, thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you, Megan. I'm so fun. excited to see you in real life at some point. I know, please. Okay, yes. all right. And Women and Children First, I'm so excited to see you too. Everyone, thank you so much for being here. We're so grateful for your time. Um, you can hit the buy the book link right down there. I, in my screen, I'm I'm pointing at it perfectly. I don't know. I don't know what that's going to look like. Um, but anyway, we are so grateful. Um, go grab the book. Um, all right. Thank you. Really, I'll talk to you. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna text you after this. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Good night, everybody. Bye.